Good day, class. And uh, we are about to start our class today. Um, it's a pity that some of our colleagues are not here now, but we won't be wasting time waiting for them. So I'll go straight to sharing my, my class note for today so that we can begin our class in earnest. So let's share the notes. Okay, so this is the, the class note for today. We are going to be doing um, session seven. Just a moment, let me get things ready. So I can be seeing you all and your chats. All right, in session seven, we have two topics to be discussed. The first one is determination of residence. Determination of residence. The second one is objection and appeal procedures. Now, these two topics are theory topics, but they play a very important role in our understanding of our tax. So this is important if you must understand taxation. So let's go with the class rules because where there are plenty of people, we need to retreat and enforce what is acceptable in the class. All right. One of the classrooms says that students are to be muted on both audio and they're not allowed to start their video. This is one of the rules in the class that has been flaunted every week. Every class, we get students disobeying this rule. I would like you to prove me wrong by obeying this rule today. Okay, and uh, that is the only rule I want to state in this class. We are all mature and I believe we are going to abide by it. <clears throat> okay, so the class for today is a determination of residence. Now, why is determination of residence very important? In this topic, we shall learn the following. That one, residents play an important role in the taxation of an individual. Residence, not nationality, is the basis of taxation of an individual. We're also going to see that principal place of residence we're going to learn about what is principal place of residence. Then we shall talk about the rules for the determination of an individual's residence and how it has a connection to his source of income. Then we shall see how we resolve disputes arising from the application of the rules of residence. So let's start. What is taxation determination of residence? Now let's see. Taxation in taxation, residents play an important role in determining the tax authority that an individual is liable to pay his tax. You know, the companies if you are a company which is a limited or a PLC, there is nothing like residence. There's no problem with where you pay your tax. You pay your tax to the FIRS. That is, 
if you are a company that is incorporated in Nigeria, there is no doubt where you pay your tax. But what if you are an individual? As an individual, you don't pay your tax to FIROS, but you pay it to the state board of internal revenue. Which board of internal revenue will you pay your tax? That is the issue. And so this topic has to do with individuals, not companies. Now, it is important to know residents. How does residents play a role in which of the state board of internal revenue you are going to pay your tax? Now, there is a difference between an individual, between the place where an individual is resident and the place he is deemed to be resident. So you may be residing somewhere, yes, but you are deemed to be residing in another place for the sake of tax purposes. We're going to look at what these things mean. So if you pay attention to the highlighted place in your notes, it's going to help you understand this topic very, very well. Now, determination and importance of residence. In personal income tax, determination of residence is vital for the purpose of identifying the relevant tax authority. And so the first schedule of the Personal Income Tax Act provides details for the determination of residence. What are some of these details? Now, who do we call a resident individual? That means who do we call a resident person? Now, an individual is regarded as resident in Nigeria in an assessment year. So what is an assessment year? For an individual who is not a company, an assessment year is January to December. So, because, you know, individuals is a um, fiscal year of the, of the government. So each year is an assessment year. An individual is regarded as resident in an assessment year if he satisfies three conditions. One, he is domiciled in Nigeria. What do we mean by domiciled in Nigeria? It means you live in Nigeria. You sleep, wake up, go to whatever place of work or business. In fact, you are living in an address in Nigeria. You are physically located in Nigeria. That is the first definition for a resident individual. Now, the second one clarifies now. Is a person is resident in Nigeria if he sojourns in Nigeria for a period amounting to 180 days or more in a 12 month period. So if you calculate any 12 month period, in fact, if you calculate the 12 month period in 2012, uh, 2020 or tw let's say 2019, you calculate any 12 month period. Let's say you spent three months between January to March, you go out of Nigeria and you spend nine months and you come back. Of course, you'll be coming back the next year. It means that you would not have uh, fulfilled the 183 days. But let's say you spend three months in Nigeria, you go away come back before the end of six months, 
then you now spend the remaining of the year in Nigeria, you would have hit the 183 days. If you look at it, 183 days divided by 30 days is going to give you 6.1. That means if you stay in Nigeria for complete six months, you can be called a resident in the future. Not be that I'm sorry for the, the, the break in transmission, so sorry. I don't know what's happening to network, but we shall defeat network anyway. So I was explaining that somebody could be resident in Nigeria for some years. Then when he gets to an assessment year, the person leaves Nigeria. The person is no longer resident in Nigeria. So for that year, he stops being a resident in Nigeria. He is not a resident individual. Now, I am looking at resident individual and non-resident individual together. So you see, he's domiciled in Nigeria. Yeah, he's not domiciled in Nigeria. So anybody who is not in Nigeria physically is not a resident individual. And if you, are shuffling Nigeria off and on, but you are staying less than 183 days, you are not a resident individual. Now, if you are a diplomat, if you are a diplomat, now a diplomat is somebody who is representing his country. So let's say you're an ambassador to the United States. So you you go to a Nigeria embassy in the United States. That place in the United States, though it is not in Nigeria, that place is seen as a territory in Nigeria. So you are still a resident individual. So you are serving as a diplomat for Ni Nigeria and you are in another country. Because you are a Nigerian diplomat serving another country, you are a resident individual in Nigeria. But assuming you are a Nigerian serving as a diplomat, not representing Nigeria, but in another country, you are not resident in Nigeria because you are not representing Nigeria. Or let's say you are a diplomat of another country and you are serving in Nigeria. 
let's say, the ambassador of uh, United States for Nigeria is living inside Nigeria. He is not resident in Nigeria since by virtue of his office as a diplomat and ambassador, he is resident in another country. So look at this definition. You must be living in Nigeria. You must be staying for 183 days or not. Otherwise, you are not re resident. But if you stay for more than 183 days and wherever you are, you are deemed resident in Nigeria because you stayed in Nigeria for 183 days or more. And as a diplomat, whatever country you are serving, as long as you are serving for Nigeria, in that country, you are deemed resident in Nigeria. So you see the word deemed is coming here. So it's either you are resident in the real meaning of the word, living or domiciled in Nigeria, or you are deemed resident by meaning of these two definition, definitions here. Now, a non-resident individual becomes liable to tax in Nigeria from the day he commences to carry on trade, business, vocation or profession in Nigeria. So you see, a non-resident person comes into Nigeria and from day one is dealing in buying and selling, is trading. We no longer count that, ah, this man has not stayed 183 days old. From the day you start carrying out trade in Nigeria, you are seen to be resident in Nigeria. So what does this non-residency mean? It means that if he is just for contract of um, contract for employment in Nigeria, he receives his employment income by working in Nigeria for less than 183 days. He is not a resident individual. But if he's working from in Nigeria as an employee for more than 183 days, then he becomes resident in Nigeria. So that's why they say in the case of employment income, he is liable to tax in Nigeria when he becomes resident. So if he stays 182 days working in Nigeria, any money in Nigeria, it has not entered one day three days. He is not liable to Nigeria. The moment it hits 183 days, then all the tax is liable in Nigeria. From that date, he be clocks 183 days. So you see, residency really involves employment income. The days you count really involves employment income. But the moment it goes away from employment income to other sources of income, then you are seen as resident individual. All right, let's go. Residents should not be confused with nationality. The Nigerian tax law attach importance to residents and not to nationality. So, whether you are a citizen of Nigeria or a citizen of another country, the same standard will apply to you as far as you are resident in Nigeria. Let me give an example. Um, uh, Nigerian footballers, let's say, um, who is this person's name again? John Mikelobi. He is a Nigerian in, by origin. He's a Nigerian by origin, right? Fine. But the fact that he stays in Russia, he is not resident in Nigeria, but he is Nigerian by origin. And so because of that, he is not treated as resident nigerian resident even if he comes to nigeria to see his family members or to do one or two things in nigeria 
as long as he does not stay more than 183 days, he does not pay his tax to Nigeria. Now, is he doing business? He is employed. So he only comes to carry out his employment purposes in Nigeria and off he goes. Now, let's look at if we have a foreign coach coaching Nigerian team. Let's say we have a, a coach from Germany. The person is a nationality of German, Germany, but he is in Nigeria, domiciled in Nigeria, receiving employment income from Nigeria, staying more than 183 days coaching the Nigerian team. So he is a resident of Nigeria, though not Nigerian by nationality. And so you can see people, when you fill a form, You'll be asked to state your your where you are resident. Your state they will tell you your state of origin is not too important. They might tell you your state of residence, where you reside. That is important for the sake of tax. Then sometimes you will hear nationality. Sometimes it's also minor important but residence is of major importance so i've given you an example of a foreigner earning income in nigeria he is resident in nigeria because he earns his income in nigeria stays for more than 183 days and he's not even a diplomat but we see somebody who is a nigerian origin earning an income outside nigeria Sometimes he comes to carry out his duty in Nigeria, but he is not taxed by Nigerians. Okay, so that is for residence and nationality. So we have seen residence, the meaning of residence. Let's go forward. Now, place of residence. We are coming to the meat of the, of the whole thing. Place of residence in relation to an individual means that this is the place that is available for his use on a domestic for domestic purposes that is what is available for his domestic use on a relevant day and it does not include hotel or rest place or any other place which is lodging temporarily unless no more permanent places are available for its use on that day so that means you are in nigeria you enter into nigeria and you stay in a hotel when you stay in a hotel and you are carrying your work out in a hotel you leave wake up in the hotel and you spend one eight three days you're not a resident of Nigeria because you are living in a hotel or a rest house. So your place of residence is where you sleep and wake up, excluding hotel or other place where you have a temporary lodging. That means that where you have a permanent lodging is your place of residence. That will also mean that because we say uh, permanent place, that doesn't mean that if you are squatting in somebody's place and you are going to work, that doesn't mean that you are not uh, having a domestic place. That is also your domestic place because it is not a hotel. It's not a hotel. The fact that you are not paying for that place does not mean that it is not for your use for domestic use in nigeria so you are squatting with somebody you are staying in this house seem permanent that is your place of residence when you ask somebody where do you somebody ask you where do you live and you say ah i live i stay so and so place that is your place available for your domestic use so just note that apart from hotel because hotel is seen as a temporary lodging. Every other place in Nigeria is where you stay, sleep, and wake up and 
carry out activities that is your place of residence now there is this thing called principal place of residence now why does principal place of residence come into existence it comes into existence when you have two places that you are residing for example somebody is residing both in lagos and in abuja like i used to do now one of them will be your principal place of residence now let me use myself an example now i have a place of residence in lagos i also have a place of residence in abuja some of my things are in abuja and some of my things are in lagos now where is my principal place of residence we are going to look at it now principal place of residence in relation to an individual with two or more places of residence on a relevant day not being within not being both within one territory so you see what i'm saying not in one territory that means one is in abuja one is in lagos because if the two of them are in lagos then there is no confusion lagos is my place of residence but now it is one in abuja one in lagos now look at it the a part says in the case of an individual with no source of income other than pension so if i'm retired i'm receiving pension now where i usually reside is where my source is where i would say is my uh, residence so you know when you are you are residing in a particular place more often than the other place the place you are residing more often becomes the place you usually reside so that is for the purpose of tax it is where you usually reside so when you check all the places you reside which one you spend more time is where you usually reside now you may be thinking uh, pension do we tax pension we don't tax pension because pension pension is tax free but we still need to know your residence your place of residence we still need to know your principal place of residence because you may change your sources of income from pension to another maybe having another form of income so but for now if you don't have any source of income you are not earning from salary you don't go to work you don't have on end income it's only pension then you see your place of residence is where you usually reside now for a person who has a source of end income when we say end income now other than pension because pension is an end income another another end income could be employment income it could also be um, business income so you should it could also be partnership partnership income is still an employment income so one if you are earning your income as a salaried person or as a self-employed businessman that means you have a source of income it means that wherever is nearest to your place of work if you're a salaried person or wherever is nearest to your business that is where is your principal place of residence so now let me use myself as an example i am in abuja i am in lagos where do i work i work in lagos so my principal place of residence will not be lagos so that's it all right then in the case of an individual who has a source or sources of unearned income in nigeria 
So that place or those places he usually resides. So you now see that um, for an unearned income, such as investment income, we talk about rent, house rent, talk about interest, talk about dividends, like what we discussed last week. So you see why we had to discuss all of these last time before we have to talk about these so that you understand. Now, when you talk about on end income, you could have a house. I can be in Lagos here and have a house in Abuja and I'm collecting rents. I can have another house in Port Harcourt and I am collecting rents. I may be shuffling between here and there. But where do I usually reside? I've told you how to calculate usual reside. Where do you stay the most? That is your place of residence in relation to your own end income. So when, they, when you collect your rent from Port Harcourt, they will not be taxing you from Port Harcourt. They will be taxing me from Lagos because I usually reside in Lagos. So wherever I have companies that I'm investing in, maybe Dangote has company, refinery in Port Harcourt, in Kano, doesn't matter. Where matters is where I usually reside. So you see, somebody could fit in in all of these situations. For example, somebody could be a pensioner in somewhere. And it could also be a landlord. So you see, A and C has, has rhymed together now. In A, if he's having just pension, we talk about his, 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 his place of residence is where he resides usually. It is possible that that man who is having pension is also receiving dividends. He's a landlord receiving rent. So you see, it also coincides with where he's taxed in his on end income. So you see that? Now, what if that man is also working and also operating a business? So now, not only, uh, not, now not only is he uh, having on end income, or pension is having end income. The end income will be considered on its merit. So where is closest to his place of work? Of course, you can't be in Lagos and you usually reside in Lagos and you'll be going to place of work, to your usual place of work outside Lagos. So you naturally want to go to work in Lagos. So you can not be usually residing in Lagos and be going to work in, uh, in another, but it can happen. It could be that you are residing in Lagos, but your place of work is in Ogun State or is in Ibadan. Uh -huh. Your end income, which is going to be where it is near to your place of work, so Ogun State will be taking your end income while your on end income will go to Lagos State. I believe we, we get that. Now in the case of an individual who works in an office, now we're talking about an, an employment income here, now they are specifying the uh, operational site. Maybe you are construction, you are constructing and you are in a site construction operational sites of a company or other body corporates. When they say body corporate, is any group of uh, people that are registered. So it could be a body. So it could be a company, it could be a partnership, it could be a group. The place of which the branch office is situated where you go to work, that is your place of residence, your principal place of residence, or where the operational site is situated. That is your place of residence. Now they say provided, then that clarifies, provided the operational site shall include 
oil terminals, oil platforms, flow stations, factories, quarries, construction site with a minimum of 50 workers. So if it's not a minimum of 50 workers, then that has invalidated that um, um, definition. So everybody will just say, okay, we'll reset the factory setting. We'll just be looking at where you usually reside or where it's closer to your place of work. So the two things here to determine your principal place of residence is where you usually reside. And we notice it for on end income and for pension. Now we say usual place, where is nearest to your usual place of work? We notice it in end income. All right, residence of different categories in, of individuals. Liability to income tax is often determined according to whether a person is receiving income whether the person receiving income is resident in a state for a particular year of residence. A taxpayer is therefore liable to the tax authority of the territory in which he is deemed to be resident for a year of assessment. Now look at it now. Let's say, let me use myself as an example. Um, I was working in Abuja for some years and so my residence happen to be in Abuja and so my tax will naturally go to Abuja and when I change jobs and I came to Lagos my 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 tax will no longer be going to Abuja it should be going to Lagos so it is said that I am deemed to be resident in Lagos now what if at the middle of the year let's say I came to Lagos in October or maybe September I came to Lagos and I work October, November, December. I am still deemed to be resident for those period of time in Abuja until the end of that assessment year when Lagos will now take over my, my, my residency. So for that period, that, that short period, that I am in Lagos, I am still deemed to be resident in Abuja. So you see the word deemed to be resident plays an important role. Now, the following rules will determine residence. All right, let's look at it. An individual, whether in employment, that means you have earned income, you are making payee and all that, or whose only source of income are on end income. Now, that means you are having a, a dividend, interest, rent. An individual in this category, category is deemed to be resident for a year of assessment in the territory in which he has a place of available for his domestic use in Nigeria on the first day of January of the assessment year. So wherever you are on January 1, that is your place of domestic use. That is where you get your, that is your place of residence. Well, you know the, the funny thing, people are usually in their villages in January 1. So let's say um, I leave Lagos and I went to my village. Now, on that first day of January 1, is my residence where they will take my tax to? Is it going to be in my village? No. Or let's say I went to Abuja to go and visit and I spent one month starting from January till January 1 to January 31st. Now, because they say on the first day of January, that does not mean that where you find yourself, that place you stay for visit, short visit, is not where you have for your domestic use. You go back to where your address is. Wherever you have for your domestic use 
is your place of residence. So when you are going for that short visit, did you carry your whole load? You didn't. Because you have the intention that you are going to come back to your main place. So that's it. So it means that on January 1, where is your main residence? That is where you are deemed to be resident. Now, whether for employment purposes, and much especially for uh, on end income, all right? Apart from hotels. Now, an executor, who is an executor? An executor is a lawyer who is enforcing a will that a testament of a deceased person. Now, let's say I am a lawyer and I reside in Nigeria, and I reside in Nigeria, okay? But I have a client in Abuja who asked me to write his will, okay? And for, unfortunately, this person dies after some time. I am not executing his will. I am an executor. So an executor is deemed to be resident in the territory in which the deceased individual was last deemed to be resident. So if the person that is my client, that was my client who died, was resident in Abuja or Whatever he was doing, he was shuttling everywhere, but the government says that he is deemed to be resident in Abuja, then that is where I, acting as his executor for the purpose of enforcing the law on his estate, is deemed to be resident because I'm going to be paid for that job. And so that job is going to be taxed. And so the tax will go to where that individual that is deceased is deemed to be resident. Or if he were to be alive, where would he reside? That is where the tax for my services as an executor will be, will be taken to. Now, it is not me. The, the law is not looking at where me, the executor, is resident. It, although, yes, it's going to be an income to me, but they're not looking at me as the principal person here. They are looking at the deceased. So you see, the deceased person, where is he resident? So you should call, this should come back to your mind. A trustee of, an, of any trust or settlement a trustee of any trust or settlement that's a topic we are going to be taking if my partner does not take it this week we'll take it next week about trust units and estates now if you are a trustee it means that somebody is putting you on trust it could be that a minor is a named beneficiary now this minor who is a named beneficiary maybe an infant maybe he lost his parents and is the maybe perhaps sole beneficiary, so to speak. And they now put me in trust. So I'm a trustee to that person. So I am keeping that estate for him until he's of age to manage it for himself. So now I am deemed to be resident where all the income of settlement or trust for a year of assessment arise. So wherever all the money for the settlement or the trust, which I am being kept as a trustee is arising, that is where I am deemed to be resident for that year. So B and C are likely related because an executor is acting for deceased, a trustee is acting for a, a, for someone as a trust of someone 
when there are more than one beneficiary, or maybe if the beneficiary is a minor, it all has to do with the deceased. So where a deceased who has created a trust is, is gone now, and the settlement for it, where it arises, so you see B and C are just related. So let's not talk too much on that. Now, when we talk about partners in partnership, I can be in Abuja, there may be Prof. Ayo, Ayo me could be in Lagos, there may be Prof. Ayo Deji could be in Ibadan, then maybe Prof. Uh, Adesua could be in uh, Edo. You see, we are all partners and we are uh, residents in different places. So, but we will have partnership income. We will have something that the, the law will tax on our partnership business. So partners in a partnership are deemed to be resident where the principal office of the partnership is situated on the first day of that year. So if our partnership was situated, our partnership principal office where we registered our office as our registered office. So when you go to the CAC, in case you want to register your company, you will be asked where is going to be your principal office, your place where your office is located. But sometimes you could change it. So when you change it, you know, it changes your, um, your tax um, residency, your residency, you change it and you change your tax authority. That's why they are asking you for your residence. Where the principal office of the partnership is, that is where the tax will go. So it doesn't matter whether you are in London, but you are receiving the dividend of your partnership. Your partnership, the taxation for you will be taxed from to be going to where is closest to your principal office of partnership. So you could be in a partnership business, you could also be having a house somewhere else. You could also be going to your place of work or you own your own personal company or business. And you may be receiving pension. So you see all these kind of things now. You have different source of income for pension where you usually reside for uh, on end income like dividends where you usually reside for Partnership, where your partnership principal office is. And you may not be going to the partnership office all the time, maybe because you also have a different office. So people could be a partner, silent partner, and they will be a, 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 an active worker somewhere. So you see that, that you can have different residence issues. So you can see how it is being clarified. So when you hear of partnership, you think, where is the partnership office situated? That is the taxing authority for the partnership. Now, when it goes to a village head, a village or indigenous community is deemed to be resident in the territory in which the community is found. So if the community is found in Lagos, that is where you are deemed to be resident. An itinerary worker, a worker who is not in one place, he has movement, he moves from one place to the other, is deemed to be resident where he is found in a year of assessment. So the problem here is with the itinerary worker. So he, he may be found in several places in one year. He may be found in several places in one year. So that is where the problem is. Now look at an individual who is not being a person accessible by FBIN section two, subsection one B, who holds a foreign employment on the first day of, Niger of January in a year of assessment, or who becomes liable to tax in Nigeria for that year by reason of his entering that employment during that year shall be deemed to be resident for that year in the territory 
in which the principal office of his employer is situated on that day or on the day his foreign employment commences as is the case may be. So if you are holding a foreign office where your office, principal office is located, that is where you are being deemed to be resident. So when a footballer has an office in outside Nigeria, even though he's a Nigerian, his principal office is outside Nigeria. So he's a non-resident individual. An individual whose only source of end income arising in Nigeria on the first day of January in any year of assessment is a pension or who has a who had a place of principal place of residence on that day shall be deemed to be resident for that year in the territory in which that place or principal place of residence is was situated on that day all these are just strengthening the the convention that for pension where you usually reside now let me take all of this again so that you get the point i will start with end income the first one is only pension it means wherever you usually reside that is where your taxing authority will be of course you're not taxing pension but just know that that is where you are deemed to be resident suffice now and income you are an employee contract for employment you are going to work as an employee you are not the employer you are the employee you are deemed to be resident on the place where it's closest to your place of work. So you are living in Lagos, your place of work is in Ogun State. That's where principal place of residence is. You are now the employee, um, the employer, and income, or you are a, a partnership and income, it is where your principal office is, the place where your principal office is. That is your resident, um, where you are deemed to be resident. Now, on end income, where you usually reside, that is where your place of residence is deemed to be. Meaning of income. Income chargeable to tax is the aggregate amount, which is, when we say aggregate amount, it means the sum total, each of which of is the income of every taxable person for the year from a source inside or outside Nigeria. So if you are a taxable person in Nigeria, they will bring all your sources of income, both the one you are earning in Nigeria and the one you are earning outside Nigeria, they will gross them up. That is the chargeable income. And it includes gain. Or profit. When we say gain, uh, when you dispose an asset, an asset is not your everyday uh, stock in trade. So you dispose an asset and you make gain. You will show it. So you will be taxing. They will be taxing you if it is something that is qualifying for what they call capital gains tax. It becomes chargeable. Now profits from any trade or business. Of course, profit is what you get when you are doing business. Uh -huh. Now, that is the first part. Either you are making gain or you are making profit. The other one is when you are just getting income from salary, wage, fee, allowance, profit or gain from employment. So this second one has to do with employment so your income is either from employment or from business that is what you are saying employment or from business that is what we call end in that is what we call income so end income 
has to do with any income derived from trade and employment. So that is what we are saying. Income in, and gotten from trade, income gotten from employment. All right, so we find out that gratuity and pension are all income. But you know, gratuity is especially excluded. We learned that there are times. Place of residence, we will not talk about it. It's just a, it's just a repetition of what I have said. Now let's go to unearned income. These are income derived from other sources of employment, other sources other than employment, business or reward for service rendered. So when you are not doing uh, trading, you are not owning a business, you are not trading, you are not in employment, but you have on end income, then that means that is the sources of income you have other than business and employment. Now they say it includes rental income, dividends, royalties, earnings from trademark, something you just sit down and you have, you've done the work once and you earn it several times it's on end income. Now I want to ask, is an estate agent, an estate agent, you deal on estates, you buy, you're a surveyor, you also do estate, estate job, you buy and sell houses. And you also, your job is taking care of managing estates. You take the rent and all that, you act as a go-between and all that. Is that an unearned income? No, it is an end income to the estate agent, but to the owner of the property, it is an unearned income. So we've talked about uh, the place of residence for those ones. Then we still talk about company, a corporation soul, a corporation soul or body of individuals other than a family or community shall be deemed to be resident for a whole year in the territory in which the principal office is situated. We said that if you're a company or a partnership, you're a body of individuals. Now let's see how we can resolve disputes over residency. Where the territory of residence of an individual for a year of assessment may be determined under more than one of the preceding circumstances, it shall be determined by the first determined circumstances applicable. So which of these circumstances is applicable? So most times they will first of all take where you are usually residing before they look at your nearest place to your place of work. If by reason of A, a determination of residence of an individual for the year of assessment fails to be revised by a tax authority, other than that of the authority in which the individual is finally deemed to be resident for that year, it shall discharge any assessment made by it on the income of the individual for that year. Where there is a dispute between two or more taxing authority or between the tax authority and an individual with respect to the residence of an individual for a year of assessment, the aggrieved party shall set out all the grounds on which he relies to refute that determination, to refute that determination. So they are saying that, okay, you have an issue with Lagos State Taxing Authority. They say, we are supposed to tax you here in Lagos. Or perhaps I have an issue with Abuja. They say they want to tax my tax, my income in Abuja. And I said, no, I'm no longer in Abuja. I'm in Lagos. I am the aggrieved party. I will go and set out all the grounds that I will have against that determination. Then I will refer those grounds with all the observations to by that authority. So I will get what the tax authority is saying, no, you are supposed to be in, in Abuja, you are, your address is still showing Abuja, maybe you have bank, 
that has addresses in Abuja. How can you be telling us that you're in Lagos? I said, okay, that's your observation, right? This is my own observation. Here is yours. I will channel everything to the Joint Tax Board. So you know now that when the Joint Tax Board usually gives tax identification number to individuals, so it is the Joint Tax Board that is going to preside on the, they were going to adjudicate over disputes. The secretary to the joint tax board shall give notice of any grounds, observation, or facts referred to it by relevant tax authorities to those parties, including the individuals who are affected or likely to be affected by a determination of residence by the tax authority and shall afford the parties a period which is not less than 14 days from the issue of the notice in which to reply, reply there to. So you see, it is saying here that how do we issue, how do we resolve issue? It is when you don't agree, you go to the joint tax board. The joint tax board is the, 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 the arm that is responsible for adjudication. Now, when um, the Joint Tax Board has ruled, the determination of the Joint Tax Board, that's the EPAT, shall be binding on all tax authorities and on an appeal tribunal, but may be questioned by the individual in the High Court of the Territory of the Taxing Authority, which has made the relevant assessment. So it means that the tax, the Joint Tax Board shall rule if the person who is aggrieved is not um, in satisfaction of that he may go and appeal to the high court then the matter could escalate from the high court to the court of appeal and from court of appeal it could go to the supreme court and when the supreme court rules then that's final so we've seen that uh, one, residence is important when we are talking about an individual and his tax. We've seen the place of principal place of residence and where you are deemed to be resident. We've also seen that the joint tax board is the adjudicating body set up to resolve a dispute between an individual and a taxing authority in determination of residence. Now, take note, it is determination of residence. So you know that the Joint Tax Board is the one giving the, the team to individuals. And suffice it to say, to when you register a business name, you are also still being looked as an individual. Although that your business name is a person on itself, but it's also having your face. So of course that business name will have an office, it's still an office, so that business name where it is registered is the principal place of residence, unless it is moved. So the JTB is a body that uh, adjudicate over residency. Give me one minute. Okay, I'm back now. So for the next five minutes or less, let's discuss this question. Mr. Alex Sanchez was employed by Xenox Limited as a director of Commercial West. So now you know that we're talking about Mr. Alex Sanchez. This is employed, so we say it's employment income. And 
as a director commercial west and central africa sorry as a direction director commercial west and central africa with effect from this date march 1 2010 so that means that he is not in nigeria he entered nigeria on this date so look at it march 1st 2011 he entered nigeria on this date on the date his employment became effective so on this date and remained in nigeria till 25th august 2011 the same year he returned to nigeria on 15th of january 2012 and remained till 31st july 2012 required explain the basis for the taxation of the income earned by mr sanchez in nigeria for the relevant years you know this is employment income and we say it is on um, actual year so let's look at the actual year if you can see my calculator, please, you can just go to the message and type that you can see my calculator. I want to be sure that you can see my calculator before I proceed. So if you can see my calculator, just type you, you can see my calculator. Let me also get a feedback if you have been hearing me. So if you can see my calculator, I want you to go to the, to the chat section and type, I can see your calculator. I'm not getting feedback. There are five students here, no feedback. Madam Gloria say, I can't see it. Who else again can't see it? I can't see your calculator. Okay. If you can see it now, say you can see it. If you can see it now, say you can see it. Yes, you can. Okay, so let's look at it now. So you can only see the calculator, but you cannot see my notes. Okay, let's go on. Now, he entered into Nigeria on the 1st of March. Okay, thank you, thank you. I didn't say you, you should, don't open your, your audio, please. I know that somebody is going to break that love. Don't uh, on your video or your audio. I know somebody is going to break it. And I helped in breaking that law, sorry. Okay, let's do calculation. We are asking to explain the basis of taxation of the income of this Mr. Sanchez. I want to look at, 183 days as the cutoff period now i am looking at it now he came into nigeria on march 1 so march has how many days march has 31 days he was there in april april has 30 days he was there in may may has 31 days he was there in june june has 30 days he was there in july july has 31 days then he stayed in august up to 25th of august so i'll just add 25. so can you see that it is 178 days now let's see whether he came back sometime in 2011 no he didn't come back until 2012 january 15. so for 2011 year of assessment he is not going to be taxed because he has not become a resident now let's look at 2012 to see whether we can tax him so he came in january 15. So January has 31 days. Let's minus the 14 days that he, he was not in Nigeria. So from 15th of January to the end of January, he stayed for 17 days. 
is date the February. February, let's use conserv conservatively, let's use 28 days. March is date in March, 31 days. It stayed in April, 30 days. It stayed in May, 31 days. It stayed in June, 30 days. It stayed in July, up to July 31st, 31 days. 198 days. So on the basis of staying in Nigeria for 198 days, you can tax his 2012 as um, income. Okay, so the next question. The next question, I don't know if you can see my, my screen. I think you can see my screen. Okay. Okay, yeah, you can see my screen now. All right, the next question says, Mr. Abbas worked with the Federal Ministry of Works in Nigeria. I'm Federal Minister of Works, Abuja. He lives in a self-contained flat in Guagualada. Guagualada is a, a local government in Abuja and travels to see every weekend to see his first wife and children in Kaduna. He also stays with his second wife and children in Nyanya, Nasarawa State, on Thursdays and Fridays of every week. Determine the tax authority to which Mr. Abbas will be liable to tax in a year of assessment. Now, look at it. He is any employment income. So where will it be his taxing authority where is closest to his place of work? So it means that Abuja, the FCT, is going to be his taxing authority. Now, he's living also in a flat in Guagualada. That is his usual place of residence. So he is there Monday, he is there Tuesday, he is there Wednesday, three days. He goes to visit his first wife, his second wife and children on Thursdays and Fridays, just two days. He goes to see his first wife, Saturday, Sunday, just two days. So most of the time he stays in Abuja. Now, even if he stays to visit his wife and children, that is not his place for his domestic use. Although it could be argued that that could be his domestic use because of virtue of his wife being there. He could claim that that is his place for domestic use too because of his wife. But where does he usually reside? In Guagualada, he stays there three days out of seven. And the other four days, two, two days. So he stays more. But Notwithstanding all of that, all of that would have been coming to place if it is on end income. Notwithstanding all of that, because he's earning an, an income, employment income from Abuja. So that is his place of residence. So that's for topic number one. Topic number two is objections and appeal procedures. These two topics are, it's good for us to take them together so that you get a good grasp. In this topic, we shall understand the procedures available to a taxpayer for raising objection to tax assessment, how to file an appeal before a tax appeal tribunal, how the hearing of an appeal is conducted, the appeal options available. Now, sometimes, like we used to have um, uh, issues when we have determination of residence. We may also have issues in determination of tax to be taxed by the taxing authority. And so uh, now the issue of residence is not an issue here, but now the issue 
is your accessible profit and your tax. Now, when a, a taxing authority assess a taxpayer, it usually gives them 30 days or 60 days to which to make payment of that tax. So normally by January 1 of every year, you know, you become liable to tax as an individual. But now, this is in this case, then we're not talking about just individuals. We are talking about companies and individuals. So companies and individuals in every new year of assessment, they become liable. So when the taxing authority could be federal government, could be the state, it's, that's why we say residency is not in contention here. They now come and they give you your tax liability. You'll be given 60 days in which to, to pay the tax. We'll be asking, why 60 days? First, the first 30 days is for allowing you to see if that tax is reasonable, if it is okay, and if there is no complaint. Otherwise, if there is, you have to file for objection within 30 days. So it means that if you are not happy with the tax that is being given to you, you can file a notice of objection within 30 days. So you see, normally the government says that um, individuals and companies should do a self-assessment. Now, if you fail to do a self-assessment or if your assessment that you did for yourself is not in, in line, the, the government does not agree with it. They may give you their own tax. And you know government, I don't know, apologies to those working in NEPA. Government are like NEPA. They increase their tax anyhow. And they can just give you arbitrary tax. I don't know somehow how they base their tax, but sometimes they are they seem to me to be like NEPA. Okay, apologies to those working in government, apologies to those working in NEPA. It's not meant to be an insult. All right, now you have the right to appeal and um, to object to that tax within 30 days. Now, if you extend it more than 30 days, then you've lost the right. So you must send what they call a notice of an appeal. Of objection. Now, what are the contents of a notice of objection? This could come up in the exam. One, for an objection to be valid, it must be in writing. So you don't just call on the phone and say, look, this is your tax. I don't agree with it. You must write it. It should be addressed to the chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue or the chairman of the um, state board of internal revenue, whichever. Secondly, you have to state the grounds for objection. Why are you objecting? You must state the reason why you are objecting. What are your grounds for objection? It could be that your grounds for objection is that the the taxing authority did not base their, their, their tax on your self-assessment, which you gave in good time. It could also be that the, 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 the taxing authority uh, used a best of judgment, which you think is unfair. It could be different thing. You could quote one section of the tax law which you think the taxing authority is going against, which you really based your self-assessment, which was disputed. So anything that you think that is the grounds for your objection, you state it down. It must be in writing. Not only that, you must state the amount of assess accessible tax and um, accessible profits and the total profit for the year 
So what is accessible profit? The accessible profit is the adjusted profit that you have that you have for the period. Let's say your year ended, uh, your 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 profit, your income or profit for the year ended 2019 December. You now bring it 2020. You now adjust it by adding back depreciation. You now add back all those al non-allowable expenses. You add them back. You adjust them. What you are getting is what they call accessible profit. We are going to do much more about all these things, how to derive accessible profits. Okay. Then, what is total profit? Total profit is when you have deducted capital allowance from your accessible profit. So, you know, you are going to attach how you determine your accessible profit. So your profit statement will be there. How you calculate your accessible profit will be there. Your calculation of uh, capital allowances will be there because that is where your total profit is derived. Then you calculate the amount of tax that you claim that will be payable. So all of this will be sent. Then you must raise this notice of uh, objection within 30 days. Now, when the taxing authority received the notice of objection, what will they do? Normally, the taxing authority usually carry out an audit, what they call a desk audit at every assessment received to see whether there is, uh, they follow the tax law, whether any provision of the tax law is contravened, whether there are mathematical error like that. So they will go to look at their, their records again. When they look at their record and they find out that, wow, it is, it is true what this taxpayer is saying. You know. Please, who, who of you computed this tax and gave him this thing? Ah, we need to apologize to this taxpayer. They now looked at it and said, wow, you are right. They will give you what they call um, amendment to the tax. Uh, they will give you what they call amendment or revised tax assessment. Revised tax assessment. That is what they are going to do. So they are going to revise the assessment to that amount that is mutually agreeable between the taxpayer and the Federal Inland Revenue Service. Now I am looking at companies. So when I use the word FIRS, I'm stating that I am a company in contention. The same principle can apply to individuals. So let me not be calling individuals. The same principle applies. But what if they look at it and they say, no, we are correct. There is no way the taxpayer can tell me this. Then they are going to reply and send you a refusal to amend the tax. And when they send you that refusal, then there is wahala. It means that both of you are not on common grounds. If both of you are on, on, not on common, they will tell you the reasons why they are refusing. And if you look at the reasons why they are refusing and you agree, then you people are on common grounds then. But when you people are not on common ground, they say it is this, and you said no, I no agree, and the tear shirts. You no agree, they no agree. Then what do you do? You go to the tax appeal tribunal. So you see something here, the tax appeal tribunal does not arbitrate over residence, but arbitrate over tax payable. JTB arbitrates over residence. Now, what is the tax appeal tribunal? The tax appeal tribunal is 
a tribunal set up by the government to, to look into tax cases, tax disputes between the taxing authority and the taxpayer. Now, there are, what is the composition of the tax appeal tribunals? The tax appeal tribunals have people working, composing it, they call it tax appeal commissioners. Tax appeal commissioners. In Nigeria, we have 40 tax appeal commissioners. How do I know? A tax appeal shall consist of five members, which will be appointed by the minister. And there are five people in one tax appeal tribunal, in one tax, uh, there are five tax appeal tri um, commissioners in one tax appeal uh, body. And there are eight tax appeal tribunals situated in different places. So when we say five in one times eight tribunal locations, 40, 40 tax appeal, tax appeal commissioners. Now, six of them, six of these locations, are located in the six geopolitical zones. And so we have one in Baochi, we have one tax appeal tribunal in Kaduna, we have another one in Jos, we have another one in, at Enugu, we have another one at uh, Benin. I've mentioned five, then we have um, um another one here at um i think ibadan yes that's six then um we have one again in lagos lagos is serving the whole of lagos state and we have the head office at abuja so that makes it eight zones where we have this tax appeal tribunal. Now this consists of a chairman, a chairman who shall preside at every of the meeting. If the chairman is absent, then any member can sit in his place. They also have a secretary. But since there are five in number, once there are three people, there is a quorum. So it doesn't mean the chairman must be there. So the chairman and two other people can form a quorum, or three other people can form a quorum and ask one of them to chair. The chairman of the zone must be a legal practitioner qualified to practice for a period not less than 15 years and must have cognate tax experience. Why must it be? that this chairman must be a, a legal personnel because any judgment rendered by the tax appeal tribunal will carry the backing of the court. It will be seen as coming from the high court. It could be backed up with law. Now, not only is he a legal practitioner who will know the law, he must also be experienced in tax matters. So his word will seem to suffice. All right. So we look at the qualification. He is going to be the, the tax appeal commissioner shall hold a term for three years and they can be renewable just once. So it means that they can there can be this these 40 tax appeal commissioners can stay for the next six years which means they renewed them once. So uh, during the eight year period of a presidential rule, because some people, some presidential rule can be four years and renewable ones, you can have the whole tenure of these tax appeal commissioners renewable. Now, um, once someone attains 
the age of 70, he retires. So you, you see that um, he leaves office at the age of 70. So after 70 years, you cannot be appointed to serve as a tax appeal commissioner. All right. So what are the jurisdiction of the tax appeal tribunal? They, has, they have power to adjudicate on tax disputes arising from Companies Income Tax Act. That means if there's a dispute between companies and FIRS with regards to income tax, education tax. Then we have personal income tax that includes payee uh -huh, and direct assessment. Direct assessment has to do with sole proprietorship and partnership. We have petroleum profit tax for only those who are in the petroleum upstream sector. Then we have VAT and we have capital gains tax. Why is withholding tax not here? This is because withholding tax is not a tax on its own. It's an advance of company income tax or advance of personal income tax. Could even be an advance of petroleum profit tax. So uh, these are advances, so they are not a standalone tax. So these are the issues. So if you have the time, you can browse to go and check um, how these tax appeal tribunal their their judgment is. Because sometimes, you know, if you have seen a court um, judgment, you know that there is a way they label it. Once you see um, HC stroke something, 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 you know it is coming from the high court. You see stroke L, maybe Lagos. Uh -huh. In the case of tax appeal tribunal, you will see TAT slash perhaps you see uh, E, you know it's Enugu, or L, you know it's Lagos. You now see slash CIT, you know that they are adjudicating over company income tax. Now it's this slash 2008, you know it's 2008 year of assessment, slash, you will now see abbreviation of the company that they are doing it and the case number, things like that. Just give you an example in case you come across it. All right, what are the powers of the tribunal? The tribunal may make rules regarding its procedure. So the tribunal has the power to summon and enforce the attendance of any person and examine him under oath. Okay, the tribunal has power to require the, the discovery and production of documents. So the documents that you need to prove your case, the tax appeal has um, rights to ask for them. Evidence on affidavit, call for witness or witness uh, examination of witness or documents. They can review its decisions. They can dismiss an application. Okay, they can act on any uh, act. They can make any action that they call expertise action. All right. They can even reduce your tax liability. They can nullify it. They can impose more tax if they deem fit. Now, hearing before the tax appeal tribunal, where an appeal is not discontinued, the procedures for hearing the appeal before the tax appeal tribunal are as follows. The, there will be a process where, where they will discontinue the hearing. But what I'm interested in it is if there is going to be a hearing. If there is going to be a hearing, first of all, you must satisfy the, the appeal that you have paid that part of that, uh, that tax that is not in dispute. Let's say uh, the tax, taxing authority is charging you 500,000 and you say no, your tax is 300,000. So that means there is a dispute of 200. You have to pay that 200. You have to pay that 200 that the taxing authority 
and you are not having dispute uh, 300 that the taxing authority is not having dispute with you pay the 300 first the 200 that is in contention is what you are not going to pay that's one secondly you must send your tax appeal tribunal a notice of appeal notice of appeal 30 days within 30 days within 30 days after the receipt of the refusal the refusal to amend so 30 days after the frs have told you no we are not going to amend you have to write to the tax appeal tribunal that you want to appeal so just like you did to the taxing authority you wrote to them you have to write to the tat it must be on you must state your grounds of appeal the grounds of appeal must be the same with your grounds for objection if it is not the same then that means there is a different you people have settled your 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 difference but if it is the same it means that well you've objected they refuse you on what you've objected you are escalating it to the tax appeal tribunal so it must be the same within 30 days you have to send all those necessary documents you sent to the uh, taxing authority to the tax appeal tribunal and you have to choose the tax appeal tribunal that is closer to you of course you can choose anyone but it's best to choose the one closer to you i cannot be in lagos and be going to choose the one at enugu when i'm fighting with fros or let's say i'm fighting with lagos state taxing authority and i'm going to ibadan no no or i'm going to Benin. no doesn't make sense so you have to choose the one that is closer to you now when the taxing authority is present and you are present who is the aggrieved party the aggrieved party could be you the taxpayer the aggrieved party could be the taxing authority so you see that there are cases where the taxing authority is dragging this taxpayer to court maybe because you are influential big you are a big money you are influential they can drag you to court but if you are somebody that they can oppress, they want to oppress you, you are dragging them to court or dragging them to the tax appeal tribunal. So you or the taxing authority could be the aggrieved person. Now, the onus of proof is burdened or, or lay on the head or the shoulder of the one who is the appellant. And who is an appellant here, the aggrieved person dragging the other to court or to the appeal tribunal. So you have to prove and satisfy the tax appeal tribunal that one, proper books of accounting record are kept. That's why you see you have to keep good records. Otherwise, the taxing authority will just give you any tax. Two, that you followed the tax law in preparing your tax. Thirdly, you answer their questions well. Now, it is not because it is a tribunal that you have to follow a court process. No, it is not a court. It is just an adjudication process. And so you don't necessarily need a lawyer, but you can ask your lawyer or your accountant. These are the two people that could represent you well, because an accountant keeps good books of account. You can explain in the language they will understand a legal personnel also knows who is cog has cognitive experience in tax is also qualified but there is more advantage of taking a legal personnel than an accountant or just somebody in your office you can even represent yourself if you cannot have a, you don't have a lawyer you can represent yourself but there is more advantage taking a legal uh, a lawyer to represent i will tell you why now when you have proved beyond doubt then it the, the tax authority the tat could rule in your favor but when you cannot prove beyond doubt 
and you can see the taxing authority having proof because they have books, they have things they can quote and quote and quote against you. These people are experts in tax law. They will sit down and evaluate things. And one, they could rule in favor of the tax authority. They could rule in favor of the taxpayer. They could rule in favor of none. Whereby you are saying that it is 200,000 that is on dispute. The, tax, the TAT can say, okay, it's 100,000 that we agree to pay for you to pay. So that means it is not in your favor. It is not in the TAT's favor, I mean, the FRS favor. So you are, they are losing 100, you are paying 100. They can actually do anything as it, it is in line with the law. Now, assuming that you are satisfied with the TAT, you go and get judgment within 30 days, you enforce it. But let's say you lose on the tax appeal tribunal. What happens? It means that the tax, the judgment from the tax appeal tribunal will become like a law to you. So within 30 days, you have to file an appeal to the federal high court. Now you have to go to the federal high court. So you see why there should be a lawyer representing you. So when you go to the federal high court to file an appeal, what are the, the, the conditions? One, you must write to the federal high court within 30 days of the judgment of the TAT. That's one. Then your appeal must be, you must state the grounds of appeal to the high court and it must be on points of law. So you are not going away from, uh, you are not looking at it from the eyes of law. You know, you are going to a court now. So you see everything will not be in a court system. So it, an accountant may not see some points of law that may be applicable. He may miss it, but a legal personnel may, may not fail to see it. So you may capitalize, you may, you may, you represent yourself may not know how to appeal on points of law. So it must be on points of law. Now, when you go to the appeal to the high court and the high court rule in your favor, that's fine. The aggrieved party could take it further. The high court could also rule against your favor. Now, I want to assume the high court rule against your favor. What can you do? You take it again to the court of appeal within 30 days of the high court's ruling. Now, the court of appeal will look at it again and rule. If you don't, if you are aggrieved over the ruling of the court of appeal, you can escalate it further to the high, to the Supreme Court. And when the Supreme Court sits on it and they rule, if they rule in your favor, fine. If they rule against you, you can no longer appeal. And so they can ask a question. When is your tax seen to be final and conclusive? Your tax is seen to be final and conclusive. One, if you fail to appeal or if you fail to object within 30 days of giving the notice of assessment from the 31st day, it means that the tax that they give to you, the, the FIRS give to you, is seen to be final and conclusive. Now, assuming you are appealed, you have objected, then the tax is no longer final and conclusive because it is possible that the, the, the taxing authority could reduce the, 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 the tax. And when they reduce the tax, that means the first one they give you was not final and conclusive. But if you, ex if you waste more than the usual time, 30 days, it's saying that you have agreed that the tax is final and conclusive. Now, let's assume that you gave notice and they refused. You went to the TAT. The TAT ruled 
If you fail to appeal within 30 days, it means that that tax that was imposed on you, the judgment tax by TAT, is final and conclusive. But once you have appealed to the High Court, it is no longer final and conclusive. The High Court ruled against you and you fail to appeal to the appeal court, it's final and conclusive. All in all, if you keep appealing, appealing, and when you get to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court judgment is final, is and final and conclusive. So that is what we have to know. So let's look at what we have learned today. We've looked at the procedures available to a taxpayer for raising objection to tax assessment. So we are aggrieved of a tax. The first thing to do is not to escalate it. The first thing to do is to make amicable settlement with the taxing authority. Write to them that, look, I don't like this tax. I'm objecting to it. When they refuse, then you can appeal. That is the first point of escalation. When you go to the tax appeal tribunal, that is the first point of escalation. Then you have to prove that that tax is not supposed to be taxed to you. So we have seen how to file an appeal before the tax appeal tribunal. We've seen the composition of the tax appeal tribunal. We've seen all of that, how an appeal is being conducted. We have seen other options available for escalating the matter until the Supreme Court. And we have seen when a tax is seen to be final and conclusive. The question can even say, when is a tax not final and conclusive? So you will say, when you are appealed, when you have objected, when it is still in, in, in court, it is not seen to be final and conclusive. So in conclusion, finally, I want to give you some assignments that you will want to do in relation to these matters. First of all, be taking it down, Question um, um, November 2014, question six. Question six, you see operations, objection procedures on BOG adjust assessment. So I want you to, is this tax or advanced tax? Okay, this tax, fine. I want you to, to look at it. This one assignment for you, question six. Then, um, Another one here is um, okay. determination of precedence, 2015 November, question four. Okay, then okay. All right, this is November 2016, question four. Okay, May 2017, question four. Okay, you see the same year again, question two. So you see this topic is something that comes up regularly, regularly. So that's why you see me, I'm giving you, okay. Another one here is um, November 2017, question four. Most of these questions are question number four. Just be checking them one, one, question four like that. Then there's question number five. Question number five is here uh -huh, for May 2018. And uh, November, 2000, sorry, yes, November 2018, question seven. You see another one there, okay? So you see that these things come up so often, so often. And don't forget to go through your object, objective questions to see them. If there's any question you want to ask, please ask me in the chat room. 
I'll have to go now. It's nine o'clock already. So thank you so much. See you in the next class.